Today I wanted to talk more about uh, deception uh, and just sort of completing from where we left off uh, on Tuesday. Um, just to recap a little bit, I mean, what we, one of the things we talked about on Tuesday is that uh, this is a sort of evolving uh, notion of what constitutes deception and whether it's permissible uh, in various kinds of journalism. Um, it was once a real staple of print journalism. It's much uh, less so today, uh, largely out of vogue in newspaper work. Um, uh, it continues, however, to be more in, um, a, a mainstay of television. Um, and the food line case has really changed some of the parameters of it. But, uh, but deception and deceptive reporting, undercover reporting, still goes on, as I said, ma mainly in television. So uh, really, I guess, what I wanted to talk about today, moving forward a bit, is sort of where are we headed in all of this? Um, and what are the kind of rules that guide uh, the use of deception uh, in reporting today? So within that, there are several uh, important questions. Um, is there a difference between lying uh, and misleading um, in active versus passive deception, which I had planned to talk about on Tuesday, but I'll talk about uh, in just a moment here. Um, second, uh, is there a difference between a private and a public place? Um, the answer to that is yes, uh, but in terms of both ethics and the law, what are the consequences of those decisions? And what really, what falls into which category? Um, it's easy to recognize the consummately public place and the consummately private place. What's harder is the, is the stuff in between. I mean, your, your home, your bedroom, et cetera, obviously are the sort of, uh, you know, one end of that spectrum. You know, Dodger Stadium is probably at the other end of that spectrum. Um, but, you know, what about malls or restaurants or grocery stores or places that are private property um, but that invite the public in, that don't screen people to come in? What is your expectation of privacy in a place like that? Uh, another question uh, to try to think about in the context of these issues, I think, is is there a difference between staging an event and recording an event? Um, if you're, what was that? Um, you know, if you are not identifying yourself as a reporter, are you in fact putting on an event um, or encouraging people to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do? Or is the point to catch people up doing something that they're doing all the time and that the camera or the undercover work merely uh, illuminates? Um, and finally, I think as a, as, a, as a question in the background of all of this is, how far can you go with an impersonation or an act of deception before it becomes a fraud? Um, some people would argue that from the word go, from the moment that you don't identify yourself as a reporter to, to whoever you're talking to, that you've engaged in a fraud. Others might argue that, that to not identify yourself at the outset may not be a fraud, but that if you keep it up, it becomes a fraud. So that's a sort of running question is, is where is that line and how do you stay on the right side of it? <coughs> In order to talk about these things uh, today, I want to talk about three examples, um, two that are from your syllabus uh, and one that's been in the news lately. Um, the two from your syllabus, is, well, I'll talk a bit about the, uh, the KM or the NBC reporting on the wholesale food market here in Los Angeles, um, and then sort of most provocatively, uh, as Seth and I were just talking about this, to Catch a Predator series, which has gotten a lot of attention uh, over the years. And then finally, I wanted to talk about James O'Keefe, uh, who is this... Uh, conservative journalist, uh, investigative journalist, um, well, some people debate whether he's a journalist. In any case, certainly conservative activist who has been uh, doing these pieces on ACORN and who got arrested uh, the other day uh, trying to break into the phone system of a member of Congress. Um, so first, uh, in order to start all that, let me talk about um, active versus passive deception. Um, active deception is pretty obvious. It is lying. <clears throat> um, and it means taking an affirmative act to lie. Um, it is present uh, in the food line case. Um, it's present in the Bagdikian uh, example that we talked about on Tuesday. In both those instances, the food line reporters made up names. They made up work histories. Um, they lied on their applications. They said that they were someone that they were not. And they didn't, of course, they also engaged in an act of passive deception, which is that they didn't disclose that they were from ABC. But more to the point, they actively lied about who they were. Same with Bagdikian. He lied uh, in order to get into the prison. Now, in Beck Dickian's case, as we talked about the other day, it's a little bit shaded because he lied to some people, the warden, guards, um, ex inmates, but he told the truth to the attorney general who allowed him to get in. So his is a bit of a blend. Um, the, the basic uh, rule, legally and ethically, I think here, especially post-food lion, is that active lying is out of bounds um, for most journalism. Um, the, the food lion case, I read you that language the other day. Um, it makes it clear that the courts will not protect uh, a journalist, that the First Amendment uh, does not generally protect a journalist who breaks a, a, a statute. So if you, as I, the example I used the other day, if you, if you, uh, you know, um, uh, jaywalk, 
in order to catch up with a source, the First Amendment doesn't permit your ability to jaywalk. In the case of Food Lion, the court ruled the First Amendment didn't protect their, them, their right to trespass uh, on Food Lion's property. It didn't protect their right to engage in fraud. Um, um, and ethically, it, this the line really butts up against the point that Ben Bradley is making, uh, both in your reading and that we talked about on Tuesday. It is hard to condemn others for lying, which is a big part of what journalists do, if we lie in order to do it. Um, so active lying is, I mean, I can imagine circumstances, and in fact, the O'Keefe case, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, test this premise some. Um, and I, I suppose I could imagine some hypotheticals where the, the ends so justified that means that it might be worth it. But recognize that neither the law nor ethics provide very sound protection for actively lying in order to get information. Um, the harder case is passive deception. And this, uh, I will tell you uh, in my own case, uh, that this has arisen many times uh, in the course of my reporting life. And I think it does in the course of anyone's life who reports for a long time. And this is basically, you know, the sort of common situation for this is you're at a crime scene or you're at some area and somebody asks who you are. Uh, police officers say, ask who you are. And you say, well, I'm Jim Newton. And I don't say, I'm Jim Newton with Los Angeles Times and I'm here to ask you about the event right there, or the, I'm here to ask you what's going on. Have I engaged in an act of deception if I give my name accurately, but don't disclose the fullness of who I am? Um, I think that's a hard call, and I think it's a hard one to make, it's a hard one to have a big abstract rule about. Um, I, uh, I can tell you when I worked in Atlanta, um, I didn't, but a colleague of mine, um, where there was a prison riot that we were covering. The, uh, a group of uh, Cuban inmates had taken over the federal prison in Atlanta. Um, and one of my colleagues went over the wall into the prison, which <laughs> raised a whole bunch of issues, um, and pretended to be a member of a family. There were hostages in the prison. And he pretended to be a family <coughs> member of one of the hostages. Um, he, I don't know. I wasn't with him, I'm happy to say. Um, I don't know whether he was asked who he was, but he just joined a group of people and was assumed to be a family member. And because of that, he got a list of the hostages, which we then used in our reporting to report on the, the plight of these people behind bars. We did a huge package on it. So it resulted in a significant piece of reporting, and it was undeniably an act of deception. Again, as I say, I don't know whether he engaged in an active <laughs> act of deception or a passive one, but it was clearly at least one. And you know, you can start to push this. I mean, imagine if the, if the sort of least offensive instance of this is just being asked who you are and you give your name accurately, but you don't disclose the fullness of who you are, you can imagine it getting more and more dicey if you, if you start to do things that make people think that you're someone you're not. If you put a stethoscope around your neck in a hospital and walked around, people will be more inclined to think that you're a doctor than if you're just walking around. Um, if you use that device to get into a room that you might not otherwise have, act, uh, at a, have, have had access to, then you are clearly engaged at least in an act of passive deception. <coughs> what if you put on uh, you know, scrubs or garments so that made you look like a doctor or a nurse? Um, obviously pushes it further. Um, you know, all of these, uh, yeah, and, 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 and sometimes this can happen, by the way, with the blessing of people involved in the institutions. I mentioned the Bagdikian case where the AG uh, gave his permission. I can tell you an instance in my uh, life. I was involved in a police ride-along many years ago um, where the police were searching a home in Malibu. And I walked in behind the police. They served the warrant, walked in. They thought there was no one there. We are just walking through the house and looking for things. They're looking for drugs and other things. Um, and I walked into a room, and there was somebody asleep in the room. Um, we were both quite startled. Um, it was quite surprising that he had not woken up in all of this, too, but that's another issue. Um, you know, that person probably believed that I was a police officer uh, that morning. I left. I didn't talk to him. But I could have. I could have interviewed him. I could have asked him some questions. Um, you know, at what point does, and I was there, the reason to mention this is that I was there with the permission of the police. Um, so at what point does, do you portray yourself as something that you're not, and to what degree does that raise ethical issues? Um, I, I don't, I'm not here to offer you a bright line uh, answer to that, um, but I do suggest that it is an important thing to consider when considering any kind of deception. Um, and so with that, let me move to these case studies and get your thoughts as to whether these uh, in your judgment, uh, across the kinds of lines uh, that I'm suggesting we ought to be thinking about. Uh, the first one, I hope you've had a chance to look at it, uh, involves this NBC reporting on um, the 7th Street food market. Uh, and it happens to be uh, here in Los Angeles, in downtown LA. Um, they, they go in with an undercover uh, camera. Um, 
And if you've watched it, you've seen what they found. It's, a, it's about a 10 minute report or eight or 10 minute report. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an open air <clears throat> wholesale food market. It's there today. Um, and, you know, they s scoping around with their camera. You see rats scampering across the food. Uh, the bathrooms are filthy. There's no hot water in the bathrooms. Um, there's the most, uh, the one that sort of got me uh, nauseous was that there's a, there's a broken water line that appears to have sewage water coming out and it's pouring across uh, fruit and vegetables. Uh, you see a, a, a worker who's urinating near a box of food. Um, it's yucky uh, by any standard. Um, and it's undercover reporting that supplies the video for it. And it's pretty compelling video. I mean, I have to say, it makes me wonder. I mean, I, I was uh, cooking last night, and it made me wonder, am I really cooking with this food? Um, you know, so it, does, it has the desired effect. It makes you uh, queasy, and it makes you wonder about food from this market. Now, the, there, are, there clearly are steps uh, that the, the reporters took in this case. Um, to supplement that. One of the things we talked about the other day, and I would emphasize again here, is that one of the dangers of undercover reporting is you tend to extrapolate the belief that what you see is typical of this. Now, for instance, the shots of this, of this uh, market, I, I have no idea whether that's the you know, only bathroom at the market that lacks hot water or whether all the bathrooms lack it. I also couldn't tell you whether every food market in, you know, in the Western United States, in the United States, suffers from these kinds of problems. All I know is that they, it captured some compelling and sort of nauseating uh, little vignettes. Um, so, uh, but they did a good job in this report, um, I thought, of supplementing those uh, little observations with some broader research. Um, they pulled health records. Um, they did interviews with a bunch of, um, or several, uh, food safety experts. Um, you know, so you get a, a broader report than just what you see with the camera. Um, nevertheless, I think it is safe to say that it would be a far less riveting report without the images that they catch with the camera. You'd be much likely, less likely to remember this piece or to be affected by it if it were just interviewed, interviews with food safety experts who said that they hear that there's trouble down at the LA food market. Um, it also, the camera also catches some really, uh, to my, my favorite gotcha moment uh, in this is after they take the, some of their initial undercover camera stuff to the head of food inspections, um, you know, he says, well, it looks like trouble, but we're doing our best to enforce these. And then they show you a little clip of one of the inspectors going around to the various stalls in this food market. And at one point he says, uh, we're diligently enforcing what we're supposed to have been doing all along. Um, well, that's, uh, that's a nice piece of, of reporting right there. Because he's clearly caught them, not only in not enforcing their laws, but in admitting that, they're, that they haven't been enforcing them up to this point. Finally, the report concludes um, with a bunch of evidence of progress. It shows that the bathrooms have been brought up to code, that uh, inspectors appear to be taking violations more seriously, the place appears cleaner, the Board of Supervisors, the LA Board of Supervisors, admits that there have been breakdowns um, in the enforcement and promises improvement, et cetera. So um, on balance, is the, clearly NBC, in doing this reporting, engaged in an act of deception. Um, they took a camera undercover. Um, into uh, a quasi-public, quasi-private place. I mean, these are stalls that are, you know, it's private property. These stalls are run by these various vendors. Um, uh, they have, you know, embarrassed uh, several workers, certainly the worker who they catch urinating next to the, the boxes. Um, they've embarrassed the government. Um, they've certainly potentially done damage to the ownership of this market. Um, They've potentially done damage to restaurants uh, that serve this food. There are several mentioned by name as places that, take, that buy food at this market. Um, so there's all clear um, potential for harm in all of this. There's also clear potential for benefit. In fact, I think it's safe to say that there was clear benefit, that they did shame the county into doing better inspections. Um, they, uh, you know, certainly one assumes that the vendors uh, who are featured in this, uh, you know, that they are committed now to behaving better, to keeping food cleaner, and ultimately they may have made food safer uh, in Southern California. Um, so what's the, you know, what's the over-under on this? What do people think about whether the deception was worth it uh, in this case, or justifiable ethically? What do people think? Yes? Um, I definitely think it's justifiable. Um, in talking about a lot of this deception, um, people have to keep in mind that uh, for journalists, their obligation is to the public, to, as we've talked about, deliver and uncover the truth. Um, 
so I think that there were a lot of health profilers, and I think the public absolutely needs to know about it and know about that. And I also think it's important that um, the report concluded with um, them talking about how standards have improved for these markets, so mm -hmm. they weren't just doing it to hurt all uh -huh. these industries. They what if they hadn't improved? What if they uh, what if they did all this reporting and the government didn't make it better? Does that change the ethics of going undercover in the first place? No, because um, they're still, like I said, they're you know delivering something that the public needs to know about. Mm -hmm. and that's those are clear health code violations. Did you have the same reaction to the food lion example the other day? <clears throat> um, Right. So, did they tell them? I, no, I don't think so. I think, uh, as I understand it, and I don't know anything really more than you know from watching it, but my recollection is that they go to the head of the inspection agency, show him these clips of these sort of things happening at the market, and he says, <laughs> we're, we're going to crack down on this. So the inspectors then go, go out and say, you know, you all need to clear, clear it up because NBC is out here and you need to be careful because they're watching you, basically. And that they capture that on tape is a nice, it's just a nice uh, piece of luck. Um, but yeah, I don't think that they were working cooperatively with the government in this, no. Um, I mean, the difference to me between this and the food line example is that the food line seemed like a much more active form of deception. I think that's why people are more comfortable with mm -hmm. it. So in, you do de definitely then see a difference between active and passive deception in terms yeah. of the ethical capacity. But what do other people think? <clears throat> yeah. Now that gets to the public versus the expectation of, of a privacy in a place like this, um, and it is open. Now, let me ask you this: um, I didn't have you look at them, but there is some other reporting um, that's happened over the years. In fact, NBC NBC has a very active and very well regarded consumer um, uh, advocacy uh, reporter, the guy who did this thing, um, and they did a bunch of reports a few years back about restaurants. Um, and the question of, uh, in fact, those little ratings, those A, B, C, D, whatever they are, ratings that the county does, are largely the outgrowth of the reporting they did on restaurant uh, health and safety. Um, now, restaurants are a far more private sort of setting than an open-air food market. Would you have the same reaction to these pieces if what they were doing is going inside restaurant kitchens, a place that the public is not generally invited to go to, and discovered the same types of things, rats, you know, uh, unsanitary conditions of one kind or another. Would it offend your ethics if they did that? I want to say no because I don't want to eat at a restaurant. <laughs> right, that. right. But I mean, to an extent, I think that it is more of a private place. I think it would depend on how he got into the back in the mm -hmm. first place. Like, did he identify himself as a reporter or did he just say, hey, like, I want to go Check out your restaurant. Right. Um, what if he lied and got a job there in the restaurant? <clears throat> Then you're over. Mm -hmm. Yes? I think both active and passive deception has ethical problems with it, but ultimately the public deserves to know. Mm -hmm. like one of the main tenets of journalism is to um, actively pursue the truth and report it. Mm -hmm. So if that's what journalism, if that's the fundamental purpose, I don't think it matters how you can feel about it. And in that instance, um, is any lie told in the service of obtaining information worth it? I mean, ethically defensible, rather? <clears throat> That's where it gets hard, yeah. <laughs> I don't really, I mean, everything that we've discussed so far, yes, there's problems with it, but I'm glad that they, that they did it. Mm -hmm. And also, um, like a more private issue of like the congressman smoking crack with the hooker in his hotel room, mm -hmm. like that was, you know, definitely a private situation. You can expect privacy there, but I think it was a good thing to, you know. To get it out. Yeah. So. Um. He probably didn't think so. Um, you know, um, and you know, one of the things we'll, I will talk about in a minute is weighing these issues is is often difficult because one person's assessment of what is vital public information can differ quite 
radically from another person's assessment. Um, and that's come up a little bit in the O'Keefe reporting, in fact. But I, I, I mean, I think your, your point is a really sound one, that if the objective of journalism is to uncover and reveal information, truth, um, then that seems to provide a lot of ethical cover for how you go about and get it. Um, but it, it does raise uh, real questions about the integrity that people do it. Especially if you're on the other side. Especially if you're on the other side, <laughs> yes. Uh, who else? Yeah. I think it's important to exhaust all your alternative um, measures. Like, if they had gone to the food line heads and been like, we heard this rumor, like, would you be okay with us checking it out or you know, reporting on it, make sure that this is not correct, and then they refuse them? Maybe if they could report on that, that might raise some questions within, like, Agencies that are supposed to check that stuff out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. A, I mean, the question of of the sort of supplementary reporting or exhausting the other reporting is always a big one. This, I think, that one of the particular problems that arises for television in this, and one of the reasons why these practices tend to be more pervasive these days in television than they are in print, is that it's such compelling imagery um, that when you see, you know, this poor schlub who gets caught urinating on near the boxes uh, on this NBC report and they ask him, why'd you do it? And he goes, well, because I'm not very bright. Or, I mean, you know, he's sort of a loser. Um, but, but that's captivating, you know, for lack of a better word, in a way that an interview with a food safety expert saying it's really a bad idea for people to urinate near food isn't. Um, and so when you raise the question of have you exhausted all the other reporting, the answer can be sort of complicated in the sense that maybe you've exhausted it to the extent that you've gotten the answers that you're trying to get, but you haven't gotten material that allows you to present it in a way that will be effective. Um, yeah. I think in doing that and asking for permission or talking to them before doing that, you wouldn't get the same story. That's definitely true. Because, <clears throat> you know, even if they say, okay, well, do you guys want to come back at 3 o'clock and you can look around or whatever, you, they still have time to tell everyone, hey, there's going to be reporters here. Like, be careful what you're doing. And obviously, these people are not going to be doing what they normally would be doing. Uh, the essence of undercover reporting is you're cap catching people doing something that they wouldn't do if they knew there was a camera present. Um, I think there's no question. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, I mean, going back to the argument about, well, if it's a restaurant versus a private, I mean, a, an open air market or anything like that, I kind of feel like it, it's similar to the whole, like, public figure versus private mm -hmm. person kind of debate where, you know, if you choose to own your own restaurant, that's a public enterprise that you're doing. Like, you, you are opening yourself up to, here, eat my food, you know, give me criticism. Mm -hmm. like, you know, you're putting yourself in the public eye, and you're opening your doors to inspectors and people that are going to have to come in and evaluate you anyway, so I sort of feel mm -hmm. like it's the same thing as if you're a special purpose public figure or a lobbyist or whatever, mm -hmm. like, by choosing to do that, you could choose to, to do a job where you aren't so open to, you know, scrutiny. Right. I mean, it is, as a, as a legal matter, it's a public accommodation. There are certain things, as you say, you have to be open for inspection. You can't discriminate based on who you allow in. I mean, if you, if you heard a tip that, you know, such and such a famous chef kept a, an unsanitary kitchen at home, obviously there's a, he, he has a different right to not allow you into his home than he does to not allow you into his restaurant. You know, uh, that said, well, what would you think? Let me ask you the question I asked someone else earlier. If the method for getting the information about the restaurant's health or safety um, were to lie on the application form and get a job there, does that change your? Yeah, that I agree with. I think that, you know, commit, essentially committing fraud is not the appropriate way of doing it. But I think, you know, like what they did, you know, just having the hidden cameras there or something where you're not actively saying, Compromising their tax forms and things right. like that. Uh -huh. I mean, that's going a little too far. Too far. Yeah. Yes, in the back. Well, I think that the whole point of it is like good for the public good. And so I think like, it has to outweigh, you know, your deception. Like that was in the book too. But <laughs> I think that like the problem I had with it was the like the guy that was like peeing on the stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I don't feel like it was really necessary for them. Like I feel like they could like, you know, buzz out his face. He may have agreed to it. Uh, people will agree to the weirdest things. Uh, but but I don't know, yeah. Um, yeah. Right, he's he's good TV is what he is. Uh, yeah, no, he's not the root problem of Southern California health safety or food safety. He's a he's a loser who got caught on a camera being next to a box. You know, I mean, <laughs> what are you gonna do? 
Um, but yeah, I mean, he, but it makes pretty captivating television, you know? Yeah. I still thought it was pretty addictive, but it's, it's Uh-huh. Yes? I was going to bring up a point that you said, like, first, like, the harm and, like, the benefits. The harm seems to me just, like, it's just really embarrassing. I mean, the market, I mean, it's mm -hmm. essentially that one option to, like, fix it up, and they're not, you know, they're not out of business, so it's kind of like, they're just pointing out, that's kind of why I see this, like, result-oriented. I mean, you got the results, you fix mm -hmm. the problem. No. I mean, it could be, I don't think it's the case in this instance, but, but one result might be that people would shop elsewhere. Um, and if that's the case, it could be har harmful to their business. Maybe they deserve it. I mean, I'm not saying harm is a bad thing necessarily, but... But then when they report that, you know, it's actually a lot better than most. Uh -huh. like, that's also good for them to report that. It's also not right. just like that their main goal is to destroy the business. It's right. also like, let's fix the problem itself. Uh -huh. It sort of patches it up at the right. back end, right? Yeah. Yes, one more. Um, I think there's definitely a difference here, too, between like staging an event because at the Seven, the seven uh, Street Market, definitely they were just observing an event. They weren't saying, hey, show me like all the weird, like stuff like right. that. Do something but, strange for me. Yeah, yeah right. Exactly. Whereas I feel <clears> like <throat> in food buying, or I don't know if you know, but I don't know if the reporters went in and said, hey, like it's really lame. We have to throw away all this old meat and like try to provoke a situation. Right. And same with like the tavern. I guess they kind of put, they set these people up. Mm -hmm. Whereas I feel like at the Seven Street Market, it was more. Well, and that's a really nice segue, um, and save any other thoughts, but to the next one, because the next example, I think, really tests that question, which is this series uh, known as To Catch a Predator. Um, um, okay, you all know the basic backdrop here, that this, the, the news organization here um, was working with uh, actually two groups, law enforcement um, and a private group that, that tries to um, uh, out uh, predators, as it were. Um, and so they set up a series of stings. Um, they rented homes, I assume they're rented, um, and this uh, online organization, the name of which is escaping me for the moment, maybe you all, what's, what's it called? Perverted Justice. Perverted Justice, right, thank you. Um, uh, they work with this group to, to sort of set up uh, chat rooms um, and monitor chat rooms. Uh, and then they deliberately plant uh, uh, people posing as underage children, um, boys and girls. Uh, in which they engage in conversations with uh, generally older men. Um, they, are, they identify themselves as children. They say that they're children, even though it turns out they're not, of course. But, um, and they try to create, set up meetings uh, in which these men will come seeking sex with these uh, presumably underage uh, kids. Law enforcement is involved in every stage of this. Um, law enforcement is present uh, at the homes. Um, what happens is that they set up these meetings. These guys come, presumably looking for sex, uh, and then they are confronted by this sort of smarmy Chris Hansen, um, <laughs> who uh, you know then sort of wags his finger at them and says, you know, we caught you, and then they're handcuffed. And, um, <clears throat> you know, so it's uh, it, this has gone on for a long time. They've done a whole bunch of these. Uh, if you look at their website, there's dozens of these guys. They even have their the status of their criminal case, which is sort of uh, weird. Um, let me just pluck one of the many examples out of this one, uh, out of the To Catch a Predator series, because I think it sort of highlights the issues. There is uh, one case which, uh, well, you may have seen it, you may not. There's a lot on there. Um, a doctor from San Francisco um, uh, in, engages in a conversation with a girl he believes to be either 13 or 14 years old. They arrange a meeting at a house in Petaluma. Um, he arrives uh, to meet her. She greets him. Um, she says she's going to get in the hot tub. She suggests he pour himself a drink while she does that. Um, he, it's a, turns out to be a frozen drink, and he goes to pour it, and uh, as he does, he spills it. So he's, he seems sort of nervous, and he's fumbling. He pours this thing, and he creates a mess, so he goes looking for a towel to clean it up. As he goes looking for the towel, he looks around the corner, and he sees the camera crew. So he says, you know what? I'm leaving, and he takes off. He's on his way out of the house um, when the police officers stop him, handcuff him, arrest him, et cetera. Um, so, all right, he has come to this house presumably to have sex with this girl. Um, but he hasn't done anything about it other than come to the house. Um, he hasn't, as far as I can tell, I don't know whether he has actually even touched her. Um, he has second thoughts about this and leaves, although presumably he has second thoughts not because he suddenly discovered that he's a better person than he thought he was, but that he discovered a camera crew in the garage um, or wherever they were. Um, 
Now, it goes on, and the clip you watched may not have this, but I found a longer version of the full report. Shows him, you know, being taken to the police trailer, being read his Miranda rights. He waves his Miranda, or he sort of waves his Miranda rights. He asks for a lawyer at one point. The officer, the detective, continues to question him. Um, and he basically admits um, that he says he would never have followed through with it, but he admits that he had this conversation online and that he was, that's what drew him to the house. So, and then of course there's the awful moment where he has to call his wife to come bail him out from jail. The whole thing is really just makes your eyeballs hurt to watch it. Um, um, so I, the real question here now, okay, so let's just to review some of the criteria by which we're judging some of these, right? It is a, it's not a public place. He's in a house, but it's not his house. So he doesn't really have much expectation of privacy in a place that he doesn't know. This isn't the crew going in somewhere else. Um, would, you know, is this inducing behavior or is this capturing behavior? That seems to me a tough question to answer. This guy is clearly on the internet and engaging in a sexually explicit conversation with someone he believes to be underage, and he takes an action. He doesn't just talk with her. If he just talked with her on the internet, he's sort of, you know, out of bounds. But he comes to this house to have sex with her. That's the premise of the meeting. Um, so, is this an, an act of passive deception or active deception? Is it in a private place or a public place? And, you know, then once you sort of answer those threshold questions, is this an act of ethical journalism that is uncovering, you know, a, a nation of predators? Uh, or is it inducing people to do things that they wouldn't have otherwise done? <clears throat> what do people think? Yeah. Well, for one, I think by, by working with law enforcement, they're covering their, their toes as far as, because law enforcement does stings all the time. I mean, the difference here is they're, the, this is something that law enforcement probably does anyways. They're just sensationalizing it, making it all right, neat for TV. So I think as far as the, um, um, I forget what it's called, like, the entrapment goes, mm -hmm. I think, I'm pretty sure that they have their bases covered as far as entrapment goes, because law enforcement isn't going to put that much time and money into a case that they're just going to win on an entrapment. So I think as far as that goes, that, that, that it's fine. It is inducing, it is inducing behavior at the same time, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, but that, that's a technique that law enforcement uses regardless, and they just happen to be recording it. You I could think. imagine, um, all, all true, um, you could imagine a whole, let's say law enforcement were doing this without the cooperation of a news organization, the news right. wasn't part of it. You could imagine a piece of investigative reporting that examined this in totally the opposite way, that raised questions about whether law enforcement was engaged in an appropriate act or whether right. law enforcement was, right. was trying to entrap people. Um, that clearly is not a story that To Catch a Predator is going to do. Um, I mean, they've, <laughs> they're in for a dime, in for a dollar on this technique, I would say. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I think what like kind of gets me is like the the renting of the house and like the they have like a I, I've watched it a few times, like they have like the girl the twenty like twenty something year old girl and she has like the voice. Like she makes right. the voice. I feel like there's so much like setting up and I feel like I don't know, just like the, the time beforehand just trying to get them in this conversation. I don't know how the conversation really you know what I mean, like starts and who starts it and I feel like mm -hmm. there's so many like things that feel like kind of putting them in that situation. And I wonder, like, if somebody else was put in that situation. I know, like, I mean, because these people seem like pretty normal people. So I wonder, you know, yeah, they're not the cream of the crop, uh, I would say. But <clears throat> maybe doctors in San Francisco, like, the fact that it could be somebody so, like, supposedly normal is kind of, like, scary. Well, I mean, I think that's one of the underlying premises. And, and one of the reasons why the series, why it isn't just a sort of, you know, smarmy entrapment scheme. Um, is that one of the one of the questions that this series poses, at least implicitly, is how many predators are there out there? You know, I mean, it may be. I mean, we tend to think of it. I tend to think of predators as this kind of very small group of very disturbed people. Uh, but maybe there's this other kind of predator, which is a kind of sort of more casual predator who, given the opportunity, will do something horrific. Um, and you know, I think that's one of the, th I don't know the answer to that, but I think that there's probably, there, I wrote down a quote from Chris Hansen where he says, we've raised awareness and created a dialogue that it didn't exist before we started doing <laughs> these stories. I, I think that's true. Uh, I mean, I think that there is a conversation about predation um, that is different because of these series. Now, whether that justifies what they did in the series is a different issue, but I, I think that you're right about that. Yeah. Um, in terms of like, 
the difference between would they have actually done it had they not set up all this stuff? I mean, here the site is like this. Is it like a normal chat room, or is it more? I don't know the answer to that. I I suspect that they sort of, um, you know, parole or uh, patrol around chat rooms to sort well, of get these case, things going. I mean, he, I mean, there's not a there's not a specific chat room set up by to catch a predator. You know, <laughs> that would raise some flags. I suspect. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, because he's already on the site, he's he's already actively talking. Even if it's not an underage person, it's adultery because he's married. And like, I don't think that just because. Uh, I mean, he didn't know that they were involved in this. It's not, Why however, not right. do it if they weren't? It's not illegal to, I mean, it may be, you know, uh, unpleasant or disreputable to, you know, to email someone in a sexually explicit way, whether you're married or unmarried or whether it's a child or an adult. Um, but it's not illegal to do that. It's only illegal to act on it. Um, and that's where the question is, I guess my question would be, there's probably some group of people that would engage in kind of explicit talk because they find that arousing or whatever, but who wouldn't ever act on it. And the question is, does this show catch those people um, in a way that they may be relatively innocent, but out of curiosity or whatever, they, they take one step beyond what they would have if the show didn't exist. And that step is the step between being legal and illegal. Um, yes? I thought it was, I'm sorry, I thought it was illegal to like seduce under, or supposedly underage person. To what? To seduce I think, you, I think you have to take, it's called an act in furtherance. Uh, so you have to not just engage in talk. I, I think that you, I mean, don't, by all means, I'm not here to give legal advice, but. Is that right? Well, also, these are state laws, uh, so there may be differences uh, state to state. In general, I would say, though, that uh, speech is largely protected. Um, now, that isn't always the case, and there are some kinds of speech, whether it's conspiracy or threats or other things that are illegal. But I would say as a general principle that to talk with someone uh, about having sex is different than to actually try to lure them into having, to meet them in order to have sex, that that act is different. Yes? Well, I think the issue is um, they're not a public organization. We haven't engaged in any kind of social contract to give up our powers and allow them to do so. There's a group in China that does this kind of vigilance stuff, and it's a network on the internet. And what they do is they do these investigations, um, see these supposed moral infractions, and then they enforce them. They call these people's houses, mm -hmm. they, they email these people, they go to these people, they follow them until they make them so uncomfortable that um, it, it's their supposed punishment for violating, you know, whatever uh -huh. social norms. That, the, uh, that the, the exposure is right. the punishment. <clears throat> gone so far that at, at some points it's become violent, at some points there, there's one person committed suicide, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think that, I think that we give the, the inspectors, I think we, that we give the police, um, we give them our rights, uh, particularly with privacy sometimes, mm -hmm. um, in order for them to protect the public good. I don't know if this private organization, I haven't given them that right. Obviously, what they're doing has a positive effect. Obviously, I want to say that it's the right thing to do, but at the same time, I don't know that it's not mm -hmm. technically wrong. I mean, just to change the model a little bit here, if these, if, if, if to catch a predator, if the camera was not present for any of these things, but the police were running a sting operation that was otherwise identical, patrolling, you know, uh, chat rooms, luring people in, arresting them when they came to, to try to, you know, complete this encounter. Um, and then a newspaper wrote about that operation. Um, the names of these people would still presumably be made public. Um, you wouldn't have these images of them, you know, weeping or breaking down or being handcuffed or, you know, all the sort of drama around it. But the same basic facts that would subject the, the people who, you know, who got arrested to that kind of public Pillory would still be there. But can, but can the, this private organization face charges of entrapment, or is that something that only the law enforcement? Well, I suspect entrapment is a specifically a law enforcement, you know, an allegation against law enforcement. Um, but I, I, it's certainly not inconceivable that so one of the one of the people who was arrested in one of these might sue uh, to catch a predator. I mean, you can certainly imagine a situation where the where the network or the program 
would be on the wrong end of a legal matter if they got the wrong person in there, if they, you know, if they got the name. I mean, you know, so there's certain mistakes they could make. Their affiliation with law enforcement probably gives them a certain amount of protection, but they still have to stand on their own two feet here. Um, you know, they're subject to all the laws of slander and misrepresentation and everything else that just, just having a cop in the room doesn't immunize you <coughs> against all of that. Yes. <clears throat> Right, and there may be very few of them too, by the way. You know, <clears throat> right. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a larger context going on. Yeah. You know, we did, this is off the subject a little bit, but years ago, um, uh, when I was a relatively new editor of the paper, we did a series in the paper on crime and the fear of crime. Um, and it is paradoxical that, you know, crime has been on the decline in the United States uh, pretty precipitously for a long time now. Um, but the fear of crime has not really declined commensurately. Um, and there's a lot of theory about why that is. Um, and one, one of the theories that people offer is that coverage of crime is such a mainstay of TV news, for instance, that is so vivid in cases like this, that even though there's less crime going on, people are more afraid of it because they think more is going on. And the kind of reporting you're suggesting would help to get at that. I don't know, as I stand before you, whether we're taught where the predator population of this country is, you know, a thousand people who do it over and over again, or a million people who engage in, in, in it, you know, sporadically, whether most of it is, you know, predation of, I, I suspect most of it is, is family members and people and people who are, know, are known to their victims. Um, I suspect, but I can't tell you for sure, that the kind of predation that to catch a predator features is not the majority uh, that we're dealing with as a society. And it may have the effect of really distorting our sense um, of how dangerous it is out there. But I, to their credit, uh, I would say the fact that we're talking about it at all is partly the result of this show. So that they, this, the thing that Hansen says about raising awareness and creating a dialogue is true. Um, I mean, it may not be enough to justify this, but I do think it's true. Right. Look at this, and I think that it opens a dialogue not only between parents and children, but between society. And so, I just think that's a, a good thing to have, especially with all the new Twitter and MySpace, mm -hmm. and everything else that's emerging. It just creates more of an open dialogue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'll say that. I mean, I have a 13-year-old son, um, and at his school, the talk of caution on the internet and the, the wariness of, you know, people getting your home address or your full name is a real part of his life. And I suspect, again, now, it's, it's a bit of a two-edged sword because I can't tell you for sure whether the show helped raise awareness to an appropriate level or whether it distorted awareness to the point that now we, we have a vastly exaggerated fear of how dangerous the web is. In any event, the fact that we're talking about it is at least to some degree the credit of the show. Yeah. <clears throat> issue with a lot of this because the people that they, you know, are sort of inducing, if that's your opinion on it, mm -hmm. um, haven't really done anything wrong. I think that there's this, this sort of thing about the internet where that, that kind of um, lends itself well to notions of like fantasy and like things like that. So people, you know, do things that maybe they wouldn't do in their normal lives. And similar to like the Facebook thing, you know, information received in that context isn't necessarily permissible. Mm -hmm. Like, so these people like engaging in these online chat rooms aren't necessarily doing anything wrong. And you know, they could just as easily, easily be like presenting themselves as something different than what they are. As well. 
But I agree with you. Um, except what ha what about this doctor? When he gets in his car in San Francisco and he drives 40 miles north, he's no longer just chatting. He's doing something to affect that. <clears throat> Of course not. Whatever. You can't do that. Right. But he still not, hasn't done anything except for agree to meet someone. So. I mean, it is against the law to, um, and again, this will probably vary state to state, but it is my understanding that it is against the law to uh, attempt to have sex with a minor. Um, so that's what these guys are charged with, because obviously they don't actually have the sex with a minor. I mean, even, even to catch a predator is not going to do that. Um, <clears throat> That's a right. Certainly. I mean, but right. I'm just saying maybe the alternative for the show instead of like inducing real life people to do this maybe would have been to like not create a reality show about it to raise awareness and dialogue, maybe create a fake show about mm -hmm. it. I mean, you know, it is what what this show prevents is the per I mean, what the show may capture is some number, who knows what number of these guys, but who arrive thinking I'm really curious about this, but I have absolutely no intention of actually following through. I want to see what this girl looks like or boy looks like or whatever. But I, as soon as we get to that threshold place, I'm turning around and leaving. Now, is that 10% of all these guys or 40%? I have no way of knowing, but neither do they. Right. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> go ahead. So just, um, I don't know. I, just, I think that like, if this is the purpose of the show is to raise this dialogue, they can like, say, hey, this is a trend that's happening in the real world, but instead of like, you know, if there's a possibility of those people being innocent, create a fake show, create a fake scenario. Don't induce real people who might otherwise not have come. Mm -hmm. to yeah, no, it would be an alternative. It might not be as uh, arresting, pardon the expression, but um, uh, <laughs> you know, as, as the way they've done it. Um, I mean, listen, this is, again, I hate to repeat it because it sounds uh, sensational, but it is pretty good television. Oh. I mean, it may not be ethical television, but it's pretty, it's pretty interesting to watch. Well, it Right, right, right. Yes, please. Um, I just think I keep thinking analogous to drugs or a drug setup. I don't understand the likelihood of talking about drugs, going to get the drugs, and then all of a sudden you decide you don't want them. Well, one, yeah, one difference in a drug sting is that the police will let the drugs change hands. So the actual, the, it, the drug buyer who comes to buy drugs and decides at the last minute, you know what? I just had an epiphany and I realized I don't want to be a drug dealer anymore and turns around and walks back out of the room, does not get arrested. Um, the person who comes to buy the drug, you know, the person who comes to have this illegal sexual encounter doesn't actually have to have the encounter to have committed the, an offense. There is a separate offense here. Now, there may be some places where it's illegal to, cons it's pro it probably is illegal to conspire to buy drugs. So there may be ways that even in a drug offense that you could end up in a kind of gray area. But for the most part, it's when the money goes this way and the drugs go this way that the arrest is made so that that crime has happened. You know, <clears throat> There's no ambiguity about that. Yes? I don't know. This is ethical. I'm not quite sure. But at the same time, how is there a way of catching these guys before it actually happens in any other situation? You can't let them have sex with teenagers just so you can arrest them. Yeah, right. exactly. And even if any other situation, they have to get it before it happens, which I think is why it's considered slightly ethical in this situation, mm -hmm. because there's no other possible way to do it. And at the same time, when you're talking about broadcasting on television, is that ethical or not? It's sad to say, but television companies and the big networks have more resources than the police department do at some point, sometimes. So by the police department pairing with it, they have a better chance they also, just to throw another little uh, sort of social uh, good into the pot here, it may be that there is some group of potential predators who will be so freaked out by this that they won't do it. So it may, you know, because, because frankly, the fear of being on television is probably at least as great as the fear of being arrested. Uh, I mean, for this doctor, um, his world is much more upended, uh, I suspect, by being featured on the program than it was by his actually being arrested. Because um, he could have been arrested and resolved his case relatively quietly. I mean, it would have been awful for his family and blah, blah, blah. But as a public matter, this guy's in a world of hurt now because of the show. Um, and it may be, and again, I don't know the psychology of this well enough to really pretend to be an expert on it, but it may be that there's some group of people who are, who are curious and might take that extra step toward actually acting out this sexual fantasy 
but now won't do it because af they're afraid Chris Hansen's going to be in the kitchen, you know? Um, <laughs> and if that's the case, well, good for them, you know? I mean, then you've, you've discouraged a certain amount of really bad behavior. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I think that the inducing being done in this situation is very different than the inducing being done in, like, the tavern situation just because of, like, the nature of the allegations. Because I just feel like it's a much grayer area as far as if it's ethical or not. Because I see the benefits of you know creating this dialogue and possibly preventing people from um, doing things like this. But at the same time, like there's a lot of different reasons why it it might not be ethical. And like definitely, probably like any of these men's defense lawyers would argue that in a court of law. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just a much grayer area than the food line or. Yeah, it's uh, I, the one thing it shares in common with the tavern example is that both of them sort of create a fake place, um, a place that so rather than going into a market or going into a you know the, either the the L.A. food market or the food line or, and taking your camera in, it's setting up the camera and inviting the people to come in and be entrapped, pictured, whatever you choose your verb. Uh, but but you're right. Beyond that. Uh, the situations are very different, um, and and the consequences are very different. I mean, the consequence for uh, you know a, a Chicago fire inspector being caught taking a hundred dollars, and the consequence of a Chicago or a, you know a San Francisco doctor being caught soliciting sex with a minor, are qualitatively a whole different you know thing. I mean, neither are, is great, <laughs> but but one is obviously you know have much greater ramifications in someone's life than the other. Um, yes. I guess that's why I was thinking about the drug versus this. Mm -hmm. Lies in the adult responsibility that these people are adults and they have no. You're given it that it's their responsibility to not engage in these acts. Whereas some of these minors. Yeah, the minors. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm quite understanding. <clears throat> no, I guess it's kind of just an obvious statement, but I guess the difference would be that they have the responsibility. Of being an adult to not be engaging in these acts. And in all of these, I mean, just to be clear, I think all of the. People, all the men, I assume it's all men, all the men who are arrested and featured in To Catch a Predator are all adults. So the, the only presence of children, for, first of all, is, is illusory because I don't think there are any actual children involved in this at all, but there are, there are people from, um, you know, uh, people who are part of this project who are posing as children in order to invite adults in. Uh, but there's no children, I don't think there's any children actually put at risk uh, in any of this. Yeah. <clears throat> laws around like predatory issues are still I think evolving and so I kind of when I was watching the clips was thinking about like prostitution stings mm -hmm. and how you can't make the arrest until like the money has been exchanged um, so I'm wondering if there's going to be like a black and white quote unquote line developed yeah I mean, it's hard, I think, and, and certainly you should ask uh, Kelly Sager and Carlene Galler when they come in uh, week after next that same question. Um, it is a little different here, though, because that, the, there the act is, there is a moment where the act is, as you say, when the money changes hands. Here, it is just a little grayer because we're not talking about sex for money. We're talking about the fact that the, the person who, you know, one half of this sexual equation, it's illegal to have sex with that person. And as, as we've said a couple times here, you really can't ethically, legally, or in any other way wait for that to happen to make the arrest. I mean, sometimes that does happen where there's been a history of abuse and people are arrested having actually done it, but you wouldn't want that. You wouldn't want to have to wait for that harm to be committed in order to make the, to stop it. Um, yeah, you have one? No. Oh, sorry, okay, yeah. Uh, anyone else? Or we'll move to this. Yeah, go ahead. I remember the point she brought up, she said that, you know, NBC has all these resources and law enforcement should be able to use them <coughs> to their advantage. I think that brings up a broader social issue and legal issue of well, when do these private organizations start infiltrating all, all parts of our law yeah. society? That's a, that's a big topic that goes a little bit beyond today's example. But yeah, I mean, it comes up, you know, tobacco companies uh, want police to enforce, uh, you know, laws against people who uh, don't pay their t tax on the cigarettes, you know. Uh, music, uh, the music industry wants law enforcement to enforce piracy. There are a lot of ways in which private industry is willing to subsidize law enforcement in order to get law enforcement to do its work for it. Um, I don't know the arrangements well enough here to know whether that's an issue here, but that's certainly a separate and big and important issue. Um, all right, let me try one more example here, um, which some of you will have heard of. Um, uh, and that involves this guy, James O'Keefe, um, 
who is a former Rutgers student. Um, I think he's 25, 26 years old. He's young. Um, he helped uh, found a conservative paper uh, on his campus. Um, he is a you know provocative journalist, and I would argue that he's a journalist. Some people uh, question that, but um, he's clearly ideologically motivated. He's a conservative, um, so he's using his journalism in the pursuit of a, of a political agenda. Um, with that sort of as the backdrop, you know, in as, as you all recall from the election, Acorn, this uh, community services organization, Acorn was a was a, a sort of late in the 2008 election became a kind of uh, object of controversy. Uh, Barack Obama had a brief association or a, a, an association a while back with Acorn. I think he did some legal work for them. Um, uh, you know, and then the whole community organizing thing was much mocked by the Republicans. Remember Sarah Palin in her speech at the convention said a, a community organizer is like a mayor just with no power or something like that. You know, so this idea of community organizers was a sort of, you know, object of some sport during the election. Um, so once the election is over, this guy, O'Keefe, um, with a colleague, uh, a 20-year-old woman, um, decides to go and test whether ACORN is a, you know, a legitimate organization or whether they're um, up to no good. And the way they chose to test that is that they put, they used a hidden camera, or maybe just more than one camera in any case, a hidden camera or cameras, um, and went to ACORN offices in various cities, Baltimore, Washington, LA, and some others. Um, in each instance, he posed as a pimp and she posed as a prostitute. And they were asking for help from ACORN to set up a prostitution ring that would bring in young girls from El Salvador, or from overseas, I think specifically they said El Salvador. And then just to sweeten the pot a little bit, they said that they were hoping to use some of the money from this operation to fund a political career for him. He said he wanted to run for Congress. Um, so, you know, to make a long story short, uh, no, these ACORN employees don't tell them to hit the road. They don't refuse to help him. In fact, they offer to help. Um, they, uh, no, you know, nobody calls the police. Um, there's a great uh, moment. I love one of my favorite quotes is in the in the one of the Southern California stings that they ran. One of the Acorn employees says, you know, he's talking about setting up this ring and funding his pol political career. And she says, there are ways, especially out here in California. Um, you know, so the point is, what he caps catches them or induces them. You know, again, choose your verb. Um, doing is not objecting to a clearly illegal activity that he's intending to engage in, and in some, in most instances, actually offering to help. Um, offering to help uh, with their taxes, offering to help um, receive different kinds of support. Um, now, this is clearly motivated not by what I am in the habit of thinking of as a journalistic purpose. This is a political, you know, politically driven undertaking, but he's clearly using techniques of journalism. This is not so different uh, than the undercover camera at the far farmer's market or the undercover, or, you know, the food line example. There is deception. There's no question he's posing as something. I don't know whether he used his real name or not, but he's clearly posing as a pimp. She's posing as a <coughs> prostitute. One presumes they are not, in fact, a pimp and a prostitute. Um, so there is clearly deception going on here. Um, but again, and, and by the way, add to it, these are largely what we would think of as at least semi-private places. This is not capturing ACORN officials out in the street doing this. This is going into their offices. Now, people are invited into their offices. It's not their homes. Um, but there, it is reasonable for most people to think that if you're in your own office, that you're not being secretly recorded. And in fact, there are some states that make it specifically illegal to record someone's voice without permission. Most of them don't prohibit taking their picture, by the way. But, but in this case, there's audio and there's, uh, there's video. Um, to go back to the analysis that I was suggesting that we should try to do in each of these, there is harm and benefit uh, in this. Um, uh, it's, you know, harm, it's a, you know, it's a technique that many people object to. It invites some backlash. Um, it, people will question whether the tapes have been edited or whether the tapes are accurate representations of the whole conversation. Um, there's a separate uh, other issue that's more of a political nature here, which is to what degree is it, uh, is it, proper to think of ACORN as some sort of extension of the Obama administration. But that's about the report. That's about the analysis of these tapes, not really about the reporting of them themselves. Um, and it is clearly invasive at some level of these ACORN workers. These people came to work this morning, you know, thinking they were just going to do community service organizing, and now they're on, the, you know, they're on Fox News and ultimately everyone. So there, you know, there's clear potential for harm in all of this. Um, at the same time, there's clear, I think, uh, inarguably, potential for benefit. This is an organization that receives government money. Um, <coughs> this is, uh, uh, and they are, have 
every reason to be held just as accountable as any other uh, part of our society or certainly a, a part of our public society. It's intended to embarrass them, but it's also resulted in discipline for ACORN officials who did uh, participate in all of this and did go along with it. You could even argue that's good for ACORN. Um, that's, not what, <laughs> that's not what he's trying to do. But, but if you're at ACORN and you discover you've got a certain number of people in a certain number of offices who are so you know, ethically lax that they would cooperate on this, you might want to get rid of them. And it may have actually helped them sort of clean house. So there is, you know, there's benefit and there's cost. There's arguments about privacy uh, and public place. Um, what do you think? Is this legitimate, I guess? First of all, let me ask two questions. Is it journalism? And is it ethically defensible journalism? <clears throat> I'll take a shot. Yes. <clears throat> <laughs> but um, I, for some reason, I, I have a problem with this, mm -hmm. just as I have a problem with um, uh, there's, this girl, um, there's some undercover reporters who go into Planned Parenthood. Uh -huh. I, I was hearing about it, in fact, just before class. Yeah. Yeah, and try to get them shut down. Mm -hmm. So let's change, in order to, to sort of remove this from our, what, whatever any of us may think of this ideologically, if these same allegations were made about an oil company, uh, that, you know, oil company executives were using, you know, a, a public grant to fund a brothel in South LA, you know, um, and the same technique were used and it exposed the same kind of misconduct that, that seems to be on these tapes. Then now, presumably, you were talking about an organization that you don't have a fondness for. Um, would that presume we can't make these judgments about ethics based just on on whether we like them or not? You know. Um, I say it is. I say it's ethically sound mm -hmm. based on the on the overriding principle that probably they can all. Good. Yes. Um, so wait, was there a film that kind of it too, or just like a story? In There's a film. There, in fact, in each instance, what. What they did, um, very cleverly, by the way, is they taped a bunch of these things. Um, and then they released a couple of them. I think they released one, and then uh, Baltimore first, and then Washington. And Acorn, the Acorn's initial response was, yeah, 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 they went into one or two offices. Every other place they tried, the people kicked them out. Then they released a couple more uh, and showed that that was not true. Um, so they kind of baited ACORN officials into misrepresenting what happened and then caught them at that, too. So there's, there's but, you know, back to a, an earlier point that we talked about, there's really no way of knowing whether every ACORN office would have done this or whether every person in the Baltimore office or the Washington office would have done it. I mean, it may be that we're, what they're encouraging us viewers of these tapes to do is to make broad judgments about ACORN that may or may not be justified. It may be that they caught a few, you know, rotten apples. But, but they caught more than one. I mean, they caught several, and they went to several offices to do this. And they say that they were never kicked out of an office. And they certainly have tapes that suggest that, at least in many cases, that was true. Yeah. So I was going to say, I think there's a difference like, between when you're talking about the ethics of the political motives and all that stuff when you're doing print versus, um, versus television. Because if you're just doing a print story, then it kind of brings up all those issues we were talking about earlier in the quarter about, you know, well, if you feel passionate about the issue, should you be the one reporting on it? Mm. Oh, that's a good point. Right. Like, um, like Linda Greenhouse, right. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But I think it's different. I mean, if you have a camera, that's incontrovertible evidence. You're not skewing it to a certain way or saying, well, they said this. You know, you can see it. It's plenty right. Evidence. Now, yeah. that said, you create a situation that would not have otherwise existed. Presumably, you're not the fourth pimp to come in that day and ask for help, you know. <laughs> I mean, so that you are, it's staging in that sense. But you're right. In the end, Either the tape reveals it or the tape doesn't. Now, tapes can be edited. There's different issues there, too. But for the most part, I think that's correct. That he's, what he's done is he's, he or she, the, the two of them, have provoked a situation that wouldn't otherwise necessarily have occurred, but then they've uh, presumably faithfully recorded it and allowed you to judge for yourself on it. Yeah? I think, you know, looking at it from a sort of ends justify the means frame, mm -hmm.
Yeah, I mean, it is not, this do, is not and does not pretend to be objective journalism in that sense, that this is clearly motivated by a desire to embarrass this organization. The only thing I would say to that is that not, while their objectivity has a place in, in mainstream journalism and it's an important place in its value, it's not the only kind of journalism. And journalism, you know, Upton Sinclair did not go to do a neutral report on the state of the meat industry in Chicago. He went there to expose wrong, and we, I think, properly think of that as a triumphant moment. So sometimes the motive of the person, while, while relevant to the conversation about it, doesn't decide the issue ethically. <clears throat> yes? Um, I definitely think that the, the motive as opposed to motive makes it different. And I would expect to see something like this and then suggesting it to Obama when he was in the paper. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Yeah, and this obviously is coming out after the campaign, but you're right. I think the, the campaign is what created this association uh, between Obama and Acorn, and it continues. And, and in fact, that's actually you're a good at segue person for me today. Thank you. Um, I, just before we conclude, I just wanted to call your attention to something in the textbook that makes an attempt to to lay out rules for this. You don't have to, if, don't worry about whether you have it with you now. But um, what we've been grappling with uh, all week, I think, are ways to try to decide I mean, there's some of us who will say all deception is justifiable if it produces a story. Um, some might say that no deception uh, is ever justifiable because it so compromises the, the integrity of the journalism. And then a lot of us will be somewhere in between. Um, we're, we're comfortable with some deception and uncomfortable with others. At the very end of this chapter, right before the cases, so this would be on pages 204 and 205, um, the text tries to lay out uh, principles for uh, judging when to, when to engage in deception and when not. And I would submit to you that while it's useful to read these, and I think they make some good points, they also illustrate how hard this is because these principles are much easier to write than to apply. Um, and I just wanted to give an example or two about that I think highlights that. Um, one, and we've talked about it here too, some other people, some of you have mentioned this as a, as a standard. One of the criteria it uses for uh, whether uh, deception is justified is when the harm prevented by the information revealed through deception outweighs any harm caused by the act of deception. Okay, well, that's a, that's a good idea to weigh harm versus benefit. That's what I've been trying to do as well in each of these examples. But says who? Uh, I mean, that's a, if you are the guy caught in to catch a predator, you, are, you certainly feel that the harm by the deception vastly outweighs the benefit of this practice. Now, he's not the best judge, so we wouldn't go to him for the answer, but I, I say it only to make the point that harm and benefit can look very different to, to different people. Um, and it is incumbent, I think, on news organizations before they engage, or, or, or forget organizations, it's incumbent on any person who engages in an act of deception in, in furtherance of journalism to really seriously weigh that in a way that is as self-critical as possible. I, I don't know whether James O'Keefe and his partner in these things uh, have had that serious conversation, and I'm not sure how I would have resolved it if I were him. But it is important to think about harm and benefit, even if we can honestly sometimes disagree about whether one outweighs the other. Um, you know, then it has the, this is all, this all comes from the Society of Professional Journalists, but. Um, their, their handbook then outlines, according to the text, some criteria that can't be used to justify deception. These are a little easier. You can't do it to, to win a prize, as it says. Uh, you can't do it because it would be more expensive or use more resources <coughs> to do it another way. Um, you shouldn't do it because others have done it. And, uh, and you shouldn't do it because the subjects of the story are themselves unethical. Those, I think, are pretty sound reasons not to do it, or, or sort of a pretty so sound set of criteria about when not to do it. What's harder is to figure out when it's OK. Um, and I would just highlight that last one before we finish here. One of the things it specifically says that can't be used to justify deception is when the subjects of the story are themselves unethical. Um, that's an interesting one because that sort of gets to your point that you know we, you want to do your best to go after people who are do doing something unethical. That's a commendable thing to do, but that in and of itself shouldn't justify the deception. And that's one of the things that I think arises somewhat in the O'Keefe example, is that he's clearly found people who are doing something unethical. Does that in and of itself justify the deception? You know, I, I would argue no, but I would also say that uh, 
if you look at these things that can justify deception, that O'Keefe and some of these other examples that we cited here can make a case uh, for that. So it's not, these are not, uh, you know, bright line issues. They are t difficult to, to wade through. And with that, uh, I will wish you all a good weekend, and I'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you. <clears throat>